So you've done work on sort of looking for moral clarity. How can we go about searching for that? <laughs> it's funny because we had a, um, in the discussion on evil a little while ago, various people remarked that um, evil sells better and um, creates more interest than goodness. And that, of course, is, uh, has been my own uh, experience. I did write a book that I spent 10 years writing called Evil and Modern Thought. I'm still proud of that book. Um, the point was to move philosophy away from questions about knowledge and realism and skepticism and how can we ever know anything and is this a hand or is this a cup, um, which is the way that many people in the university are introduced to philosophy. My argument is if you actually look at um, the old texts, I'm confining myself to Western philosophy because that's what I know best. Uh, what you see actually is that people are asking a different question, namely, um, how can I find meaning in my life and live it well in the face of inexplicable and unjust suffering and evil? And having written that book, um, I felt the strong need to do something else. I don't think it's healthy. Um, to write, uh, you know, to spend one's life focused on evil. I think if we focus on evil, it's actually because um, some piece of us wants to find, um, well, I, I think we actually do have moral ideas and we'd like to realize them. So how do you get moral clarity? Um, here's how you don't get it. I don't think philosophy goes very far um, by trucking in definitions. Um, I think people waste a lot of time trying to give general answers um, and general definitions of things like good and evil and moral concepts. I think what we need is to get good about uh, describing very particular situations um, and asking questions about them. And uh, that's how we come to get clearer. What I think is really interesting um, in this particular historical moment is the phenomenon of embarrassment, which is an embarrassing thing, or it should be an embarrassing thing. But I think we live in a culture which has made us comfortable with irony and uncomfortable with ideals. And um, I mean, you look at it in television, and I cannot deny the lure for myself of a series like The Sopranos or um, The House of Cards. They're addictive, um, they're complicated, they're incredibly well done, there's no question about it. Um, but there's a formula at the moment, not that I spend my life watching all the bloody series there are to watch, I can't, you get too involved and then you can't do anything else. But of the ones that I've watched, the formula is you take somebody who's actually doing something really awful um, and fairly early on, you know, um, murder usually comes up. And then it turns out, of course, that this person is not um, a monster in the way that people like to say, think of Nazis as monsters. They weren't monsters either. Uh, we can talk about that if you like separately. Um, but they turn out to be complicated characters. Tony Soprano has his ducks, Frank Underwood. I, each of them have their marriages, and they may love their wives even if they betray them in various complicated ways. Um, and they're all well done enough to pull you in very strongly. But what's missing in those series is a hero or a heroine. What's missing is someone who is really there simply because they want to do good. They want to leave some good in the world. Um, and I mean, if you had those kinds of shows, um, obviously you don't want to have stick figures either. You would want to have people um, who had flaws. I'm not talking about superheroes. I mean, we do have superheroes, uh, films about superheroes make lots of money, but we know that they're fantasy. Um, this, most of the stories about reality um, tend to focus on the evildoers. 
And I think that has had, um, had the consequence of making us cynical, making us um, limiting the space of possibility. I mean, let's face it, we're all more affected by art, and I do count these series as serious art. Um, we're more affected by that than by abstract principles, okay? Um, the space of possibility is peopled um, by characters, either real or, or fictional. And the less we see of people actually aspiring um, to fulfill moral ideals of justice um, and, you know, making some contribution to leaving the world slightly better than you found it, the less it seems real, the more it seems like a fairy tale. Yes, that's what I believed when I was a child. Uh, I myself is ex have experienced very often, first of all, my, uh, I, I like my book on evil, I'm proud of it, but that's the one that has been translated into the most languages, sold the most copies. Um, the book on moral clarity, you know, it's it okay, it's still in print, it's in a couple of different languages, um, but um, it doesn't get the kind of attention, and I don't think it's because it's a worse book. We were talking in the other session about other examples of, of uh, that kind of a phenomenon, but um, people will often accuse me uh, when I talk about moral clarity of being naive, when I talk about idealism. Um, and, you know, in those situations, I'll have to say, wait a second, you know, I actually know a lot about evil. I'm not, I'm, I'm not suggesting First of all, um, that all we need to, uh, that people are full of ideals. And secondly, um, that all you need to do to realize an ideal is to have one. I don't. But what I am saying is that uh, phrases that one hears both in politics and in ordinary life, oh, um, be realistic, be more realistic, um, is a way of saying decrease your expectations of the world, decrease your expectations of what you can do and of what you will get back to the world, uh, get back from the world, what the world can give you. Is that, I hope that's the beginning of an answer to your question. So does that mean that you would say that we should have more ideals because you think there exist moral ideas, ideals out there in the world that are set for everyone for us to discuss? Yeah, actually I do. Um, and, you know, as soon as you make a statement like that, you have somebody coming and suggesting a straw man version of it. Well, do you mean like they're up in Plato's heaven and, you know, somebody can beam up to them and, and um, decide, of course not, you know. Um, but if you look cross-culturally, as a matter of fact, there's a great deal more agreement than we think there is. There are a couple of exceptions. I mean, questions about the status of women um, differ more in um, different cultures. But if you talk about basic questions of justice, basic questions of fairness, basic questions about honesty, um, cheating, uh, theft, it turns out that once you go from this very abstract point back to specific cases, that actually um, you do get a huge amount of cross-cultural agreement. Um, most people do want um, you know, good things to happen to people who do good things and bad things to happen, or at least um, you know, for people who, who behave horrendously, you don't want them to be rewarded for it. And there's general agreement across the board, yes. So why, why then this gap? Why this embarrassment for ideals? Why is it taken us? We, why are we still attracted to evil or evil still exists? Well, I actually think that part of the fascination of, of really horrible cases of, you know, um, murders for the sheer uh, sadistic pleasure of it, um, things like that, I, I actually think that takes us away from the main f forces of evil, which, as Hannah Arendt recognized, are basically banal, okay? Um, people being lazy, um, 
people focusing on very short-term self-interested goals. Um, she wrote a book called Eichmann in Jerusalem. I, I think in many ways it's one of the most important moral texts of the 20th century, although she was wrong about the person Adolf Eichmann for reasons she could not have known um, because information came out after her death. Uh, her argument is that the reason Eichmann could be in charge of um, the mass murder of six million Jews is that he was simply thoughtless. He didn't know what he was doing, okay? Um, he was following orders, he wanted to get ahead. Um, the sort of ordinary things that all of us do in our lives. Um, turns out that happens to be wrong. He knew exactly what he was doing, um, but that doesn't matter. Um, the Nazis could not have, um, have succeeded had there not been millions of people who exactly followed the script that Arendt is, um, that aren't described. Let's take what I think is probably um, the, the greatest evil hanging over our heads right now, which is um, the climate catastrophe. Uh, no one planned that. No one wanted it, you know. Um, it was all a matter of very small, lazy steps, some of which people even thought were um, innovations and uh, would make people's lives better. And no one thought about the consequences of uh, what was happening. Although, I mean, what's interesting is I suppose in that case, Exxon and the other oil companies who actually did have these studies 30 years ago, did know exactly uh, what was going on. And my, my question there has always been, you know, but they have children and grandchildren, and some of them must. And you can't, you, I mean, there can't be enough mountains in the world to buy your family, you know, a, a little island where, where um, they're going to be all right. I mean, we are globalized. The effects will affect everyone. But it's much easier to think about, and that's not the only case of evil that, um, that I think is a is a banal case of evil, but it's um, it's a good one to take. And I think rather than focusing on that because it's so overwhelming, I think we'd much rather look at um, you know what are their names, Jeffrey Dahmer or um, you know cannibals and um, people who do really. Uh, sensationalist crimes and say, okay, um, that's evil. Um, now I know what evil is and, you know, I can go home and take a break and look at another series which is going to show me about the lives of some other really interesting figure who's actually fundamentally evil. Uh, it's hypnotic. Uh, I, mea culpa, I confess. I can get into these things. I can binge watch as well as the next person, and I feel shitty afterwards. I feel, you know, like I do that. I mean, those were great donuts over there, but uh, you know, if I ate too many of them, I'd really feel quite sick. Um, and I think that's uh, that's the kind of thing that happens with television series. But um, again, I think that's a big part of our fascination. Uh, uh, I had a debate just now with Terry Eagleton, who who did not want to. Uh, he wants to stick to the notion of evil as rooted in you know only in what human beings do with intention. And I understand why someone would want to do that. And I have enormous respect for Eagleton's work, but I think it's a mistake um, to see um, you know evil as this, you know, Freudian death wish and, and um, uh, desire for pure nihilism. I, that certainly exists. But the interesting thing, and I think the vastly greater number of cases, is we will destroy the Earth if, uh, I, I mean, so we will commit as a, as a race, the human race, um, the ultimate act of nihilism but not because we want to. And that seems to be to be the greater problem.
So what would the ramifications for this be then? Would you say that we shouldn't punish individuals for acts of evil? No, of course we should. Um, of course we should. Um, we have laws and um, the laws to punish individual acts of evil work better than the laws to punish large systemic acts of evil. And those are the things that we need to work on. I'm not suggesting we, we, we let murderers off the hook. Um, I'm just suggesting that we increase the scope of our, our vision to include um, systemic evils. And then moving on to your work, your more recent work you've done about the need to grow up. Is there links between your work on uh, searching for moral clarity and this work, or was it a sort of a fresh take? No, it's actually in interesting. Your... The reason I wrote that book, well, Penguin was doing a series, and they said you can do whatever you like. We, you know, we, we want people who can write philosophy for a general audience. And I thought about it for a while, and I was doing an interview for um, Philosophy Magazine in Germany, and the editor had actually read everything I wrote up to the time. And he said, you know, I think the thing that links all your work is the theme of growing up. And I said, gosh, you're right. Why don't I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll write something about that. I'll focus on that. Um, that book was intended to do a number of things. One was to um, undermine the myth that the best time of one's life is the time between about 18 and 28, which is a myth. It's empirically wrong. I hope you're enjoying your lives right now. <laughs> I do sometimes meet people in their 20s who do, and that's great. Most people I know, once they're out of them, would never choose to repeat them again. Um, they're terribly difficult times uh, of our lives. We're trying to figure out who we are and what we can do and what we want to do and all of that. And added to that, comes the voice of people in their 40s and 50s and 60s who say, you know, this is the best time of your life, enjoy it now. And then you think, oh my God, not only am I miserable about, you know, my love story or figuring out what job I want, but this is the best time of my life and I'm not enjoying it, you know? And uh, they've done, social psychologists have done studies. There's a so-called U-curve that people start getting, they get unhappier and unhappier up to a point um, and then it goes up again, um, and it's different at a rate for different, uh, uh, in different cultures. But the one thing that uh, we know empirically is um, this is not the happiest time of one's life. So why are we being sold this myth? Um, once again, we're being told um, be realistic, which means accept the world as it is. Uh, the world is extremely limited. Your choices within it are going to be more limited still. And um, you'd better, um, you know, face up to it. You'd better resign. And, you know, where resigning means um, buying into a culture that equates um, growth with having more stuff, I mean, both for the economy, but also for, um, you know, people as individuals. And uh, the goal in that book was to try and provide a, a view of um, growing up, which I see as rooted in Kant, the most important difference that Kant drew Actually, it wasn't just Kant. Kant um, there's a way in which he took it from David Hume. David Hume said there, it, there's a complete difference between the is and the ought. So statements about what is are completely different from statements about what ought to be. Now, what Hume concluded from that is basically there is no ought, all right? Um, because it has no basis in empirical fact. Right? It's just, you know, comes from, uh, he didn't put in those terms, but you can call it wish thinking or somebody's trying to assert their power over you or something like that. And what Kant did was to say, yeah, these are two completely different things and they both have force and they both have a claim on us. 
And my argument in that little book is um, being grown up involves keeping one eye on the way the world is and one eye on the way the world ought to be and not confusing the two, but not giving up on either one. So yeah, it is connected with some moral clarity. And then who, can you identify who creates the myth? Is it sort of a capitalist myth or a Hollywood myth, a myth that we get from No, art? it's much older than that actually. I mean, well, look, it's interesting because um, it's, it's very Western. Um, and as I said in starting, my knowledge of other cultural philosophical traditions is small, but I've read enough anthropology and, and seen enough of the world um, to know that uh, traditionally, and still in other cultures um, that are not European, uh, it's quite different. To, um, they're not as child-focused. Uh, you know, growing up is, is something to aspire to. And the really interesting thing is no child wants to stay a child. Um, you know, it's, uh, children want to grow up because they create, um, uh, they equate um, being adult with being able to create things, having freedom, being autonomous, making choices. Um, so how is it created? Look, um, it's also partly self-created. I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say like many important ideologies that um, you know, wicked people sat around in a back room and, and said, this is how we're gonna screw people over. Um, no ideology gets created that way. Um, and what I find so interesting is that it's self-supporting, that it's a myth that people buy into themselves. It was really funny when I was writing that book, uh, you, you know, if you're a writer um, and you see friends you haven't seen in a while, probably the first thing they'll ask you is, so what are you working on these days? And in three different cases, um, the reaction when I said I'm writing a book called Why Grow Up, they said, ooh, Susan, what an awful subject. Um, and one of them said to me, uh, my hero was always Peter Pan. Well, the funny thing is that all three of these grown-ups, um, they're quite different. They're from also three different countries. Um, but all of them um, fulfill my ideals of being a grown-up. They're all, I guess now in their early 70s, they're all working incredibly actively uh, in their chosen they're all ones an artist, two of them, I guess, are intellectuals. They're all politically active. Um, one of them, you know, uh, literally physically out on the lines. Um, they're all multilingual. They're all, I mean, none of them has, not only has it, none of them stopped being in the world, um, they continue to learn and they continue to give back to the world. And that sense of being absolutely alive is what those people equated with being childlike. Oh, I'm childlike. No, 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 you're a really successful grown-up. Although one of them is completely unsuccessful in conventional terms. I suppose the other two are rather successful conventionally. But um, so it's a self-perpetuating ideology. Um, and uh, I'm doing what I can to um, work against it. And from your own experience then, uh if your 20s weren't the most happiest times of your life, would you say there is a time in which this ideal of youth is fulfilled? Well, um, so far, I wouldn't say my life has only gotten better because there have been rough spots. Um, but uh, I feel, and I know this is something when you, if you talk to people, um, a lot of things that you worry about in your 20s you don't worry about anymore. You know that you can make mistakes and still pick yourself up from them. Uh, you know that you rarely die of a broken heart. Uh, you know that you can um, have surprises, um, you know, still that will send your life in, in quite
quite unexpected directions, you know, that you can take up new jobs or, or serious activities. And um, you get better at choosing friends usually. You know very quickly. Um, and my criterion is always, is this someone I want to be friends with if I change countries again? Um, which I didn't know in my 20s. You know, so my um, my next book is called Learning from the Germans. I think I've developed a pattern where I try and um, do one book on evil, if you like, <laughs> and then turn around and do a book on goodness just because I think it's healthier this way. Um, this is a book that I began writing after um, a young man in Charleston, South Carolina, a white supremacist, murdered nine black churchgoers in 2015. And um, I started thinking about, so I, I am an American. As I said, I was born in the American South and I grew up surrounded by the civil rights movement. But I have spent the better part of my adult life as a Jewish woman in Berlin. So the book starts by saying I, uh, I was born as a white girl in the segregated South and I'll probably die as a Jewish woman in Berlin. And it's a pretty unusual perspective to have and to think about how cultures deal with past evils. And the book is a departure from, for me um, in several ways. Uh, it obviously picks up themes that I've talked about before but my interest is not in comparing different evils, but comparing different forms of redemption and trying to figure out how societies can recover from, perhaps even grow from, um, massive acts of evil. So it's a book in which I interviewed a lot of people. I, I focused on a comparison between uh, the southern United States and Germany. Originally, I wanted to include Britain, and, um, and I thought I would talk about Britain and its relationship to Ireland, because Ireland is a country that I love and spend a lot of time in. So I know it to some degree. Um, to Penguin's great disappointment, I gave up on that third of the book because um, it simply would have made it so long that it um, it, you know, it, like this instead of only like that. Because it, it came to seem to me that what's terribly important if you want to learn from these situations is to focus on, once again, the particulars, to really go into detail um, about how people relate to their parents and how people relate to their children and what's learned in the schools and how people deal with food and sex and uh, ordinary life and how these gigantic world historical offense, uh, events affect all of that, affect literature and, and um, monuments and um, those kinds of things. So, um, so I confined it mostly to two different cases, although I do talk about Britain and about other countries and ways in which I think Europe as a whole, however much Britain is a part of Europe, we don't know. Um, historically and geographically, it still kind of is, whatever the Brexiters um, would like to say. And my own view is that Brexit might not have happened had uh, Britain been able to be more forthcoming about its imperial past and not um, be stuck in nostalgia for it. So, um, Is there a specific example of a lesson that we can learn from Germany? Yeah, it needs to be faced absolutely head on. And uh, this is not a sign of weakness. Um, it's not, um, you know, it doesn't weaken a country, it strengthens a country. And it needs to be faced in all kinds of ways. Um, it needs to be faced in the schools, it needs to be faced in the courts. I argue in favor of, of reparations, um, but it needs to be faced in art, 
It needs to be faced in public history, so um, that means museums, that means exhibits, that means monuments. And I don't think you can give a recipe, all right? Um, but I think those are broad general areas that every country needs to deal with. And I think it needs to be faced interpersonally. Um, I think people simply need to know um, uh, what happened. And it's, it's quite shocking um, how little the, uh, I have to be very careful with what language I use. It usually does wind up being white people, but um, the majority in a culture actually knows there's a massive um, amount of suppression that goes on. I mean, I, I have met really educated Britons who, if you talk about European imperialism, are surprised that Britain is included in that, which is very bizarre. Um, but from my own case, and you know, I'm a left-wing American who, who thought I knew um, a fair amount about the civil rights movement, but actually until very recently, for almost all white Americans, the period between uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and um, Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat and the uh, Montgomery bus boycott, it's just a black hole. People don't know anything about it. And in the past 10 years or so, there have been a series of books that have come out with uh, you know, titles like Slavery by a, Another Name. And um, it has become quite clear, not just to specialists uh, or post-colonial historians or uh, African-Americans that, yeah, slavery was officially abolished in um, 1873, but um, actually it wasn't even officially abolished in 1873. That was only slavery in the Confederacy. It didn't actually get abolish, uh, abolished for the entire country until 1875, which is, uh, again, um, not something that we were taught. Um, so uh, while I don't ever think that you can take one thing that has worked in one country and you know, go one to one in another country. Uh, I do think that you can learn from other countries' successes and failures as well. And are you hopeful that America will uh, deal with its history of oppression? So it has. Things have, uh, the interesting thing is so a couple of things have happened in the United States in the past three years. It was very difficult to finish this book because I started it in the Obama administration when people really were, so after uh, the Charleston massacre, people were taking down the Confederate flag, people were beginning to deal with that, and Donald Trump was a backlash. I mean, the main reason why Donald Trump was elected is that there is a sizable um, group of Americans who did not want a black family in the White House, as the slogan went. And the interesting thing, I think, was the black family was perfect. <laughs> they really were. We have not had, uh, and the whole family, from the grandmother to, to the kids. Um, as one of my daughters said at the time, so I can't imagine anything worse than being a teenager in the White House, but to be the first African-American teenagers in the White House, it must have been awful, and they were perfect. So, you know, um, that was a lie to every bit of racist uh, ideology that somehow says that black people can't, uh, you know, uh, achieve on uh, either the measure of, uh, you know, achievement, virtue, or anything else. So we had a backlash. At the same time, lots of people have begun to say, well, that was the first reconstruction, and now we're in the second period of um, backlash. Again, this period of reconstruction that was, not only did people not know about it, the white supremacists actually just lied about it. It was a 10-year space uh, between the end of the Civil War 
where um, African Americans, newly freed slave, slaves, were given all kinds of civil rights, were protected, where the federal government actually um, fought the Klan, um, where you had uh, black senators from Mississippi, you know, and it was all rolled back. So we're in a period of a rollback, but we're also in a period of um, a lot of consciousness about the history. Um, I, you know, I'm, um, I'm hopeful, not because I know what the future is going to be, but because I think we have a moral obligation to be hopeful, because if we're not, we won't make any kind of progress. So um, I'm hopeful out of obligation, not because I have a clue about what the future is going to bring. Uh, we're facing a whole lot of danger. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.